Hello and welcome to BlenderTutor.com. My name is Tom Latvies and this is the seventh tutorial in the Blender Bootcamp series. In this tutorial, we're going to go over rendering and saving um, images out of Blender. So let's get started. So this is, um, you know, this is the same scene that we just finished. Basically, now I'm just going to show you how to actually render out this image so that you could have this yourself. So let's uh, let's get into Blender. Here's our scene from last time. Actually, yeah, this is the scene we left off on with our lighting and everything. It's our three-point lighting setup. Um, and now if we want to actually get into rendering, there's a few things we need to know. We need to know what our final image resolution is going to be when we're finished. What size do we want the image to be? All the images I've been rendering out have been um, 1280 by 720, which is 720 resolution for video we have a bunch of preset resolutions right here actually you could go from 4.3 just standard definition television up to 1080p which is HD television this is what like a blu-ray would output um, so what I'm gonna do is I will just go 1280 by 720 you're also gonna know your pixel aspect ratio size for what we are going to be dealing with one to one which is just square pixels basically is what we're going to want so i'm going to leave that there and then you could also determine do you want to do 100 uh, percent this is you know you could basically do test renders at 50 percent size or even lower all the way like you know you're never going to want to do something at like one percent but maybe like 30 percent or something or i you know usually i'll work at 50 percent and <clears throat> You do your test render to see if you like it, and then once you've decided that's what I'm happy with, then you could crank that up to 100% for your final image. Then down here, you're also going to look at um, file type. What type of file do you want to save it as? Under images, you can go all the way from, you know, PNG or JPEG, Targa, I believe they have TIFF. They have a whole bunch of options. I usually go with um, PNG files because then you could also turn on this RGBA if you want an alpha in it so if you're rendering out something that you want to use in a photo you could actually have the alpha mask around it which is going to mean it's just the object no other material no other uh, pixels around it so that it's just basically a cutout of just that object for this scene though we're just going to be using you know a regular one so I'll just do regular RGB and then as we go down, we can look under sampling. Under samples, that's basically how many times the scene's going to sample your image, render it. The more samples you have, the cleaner the image is going to look. So if we look at this right now, under preview, which is what we're doing right now, we're previewing the render, it only goes up to 10. So as you can see, we have, I'm at 10 up here, 10 out of 10. And it's very blocky, pixelated, noisy. It doesn't look very good. So, if I, usually when I'm working, I will set that up to you know 25 or 50, just to get a little cleaner image. Once I'm getting closer to rendering out, but then definitely when we're rendering out, this is gonna be like the actual render. You're gonna want to set this up much higher. Usually for this image, I've been rendering it out at 500 samples. So we'll leave it at 500 right now and 25 will be okay for this. Turn that off in light paths. This is actually gonna help us speed up our renders a lot. For one, we could turn off, or we could turn on no caustics. That's gonna clean up our image in the glass and in reflections, I believe. There will be less of those little firefly dots in our image. Over here is actually a, an important one, the b number of bounces in our scene. That's basically how many time the scene, how many times the scene is letting light bounce throughout it, and the more bounces, the brighter it'll be, and the more realistic it'll be. But <clears throat> after a certain point, you're you're gonna lose, you're basically gonna be spending more time for less results. So. Um, I would set this down to around four or five. 
for max. And then for minimum, I'd put that down to zero. And you're not gonna really notice a huge hit on your scene lighting. It's still gonna look good. You can see that already, this looks pretty similar to what it already looked like. But in the overall rendering, it's gonna it's gonna go a lot quicker. Or maybe not a lot quicker, but it'll go a little quicker. Uh, for this film, we don't really need to worry about this panel unless you are going to be doing what I was talking about and having um, an alpha channel in your image. Then you're going to want to turn on transparent. For us, that's not really necessary. Um, performance, um, really the only thing we'll be looking at right now is this tiles image right here, or the tiles area. Um, that's basically, when we start rendering, it renders out little blocks of your image one at a time or depending on if you have a um, if you have a processor with more than one core it'll render out multiple tiles at a time but they're going to be eight pixels by eight pixels big right now so depending on what you're working with like right now if we look up here we are rendering with the CPU so um, around 16 by 16 is going to get you the best performance if you're running around with CPU. But what I would recommend is if you have a graphics card in your computer for gaming or for any other type of work, you can actually turn on GPU rendering. And as you can see, it's just going way faster. It's so, so much faster. Um, I believe right now Blender is limited to only using NVIDIA cards, which is what I have. So check your system. If you have an NVIDIA card, I would highly recommend turning on GPU compute. And so that'll actually change this down here. If we have a GPU on, we could actually bump this up to 256 by 256, and that'll get us quicker results when we're rendering out. So one last thing, we're going to look at layers. You could actually render out your scene into layers. If When we were moving things around from layer to layer, that is one in one way just a tool for working in our scene when we're building it. But we could also use that for rendering. Um, but if you start separating your scene into layers, what you're going to have to do is combine that later either in an external program like Photoshop or GIMP or you could actually combine it in Blender in the um, compositing nodes, which we'll go over in the next tutorial. So right, for this image, really, realistically, we wouldn't need to separate anything. There's nothing special going on where we'd need separate layers, but just as an example, I'm gonna actually separate it for the next tutorial. So for this, I'll just call it the main scene and that's going to have only layer one on it. And then I'm going to create another one. I'm going to call it plate. And we're going to have it layer two only. But then we're also going to have a layer mask on it of layer one. So let me show you what I'm doing now. We go back to solid view. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually move this plate to the second layer. So with the plate selected, if I hit M and then two, I think I moved it to three actually. Move that to two. So now I have um, everything but that plate on layer one and then just the plate on layer two. And now I could actually, if I hold down shift and select that, I could have both of them showing at, at once. Now if we were to render out the scene, it would actually render one image of everything in this image but that plate for this main image. And then for plate, it'll render out nothing but the plate. But since I have this mask layer um, selected for layer one, so I'm gonna actually cut a hole out of the plate in the shape of this mug. So that way in compositing, when we add it together, we could place the plate image over the main image and it'll show up like it was there the entire time. And the reasons for doing that I'll go over in the next tutorial, in the compositing tutorial.
So for now, I'm gonna actually leave that off and for the main, we'll just render it with both of these selected. Or you know what, I'll even just combine everything. So for now, we'll, we'll only render out the main image. So I have everything selected that I wanted. I have my 256 by 256 because I have GPU rendering on. 50% size, I'm gonna do um, 500 samples. Cool, so um, you could render a multiple multitude of ways. You could hit the render button right here. You could go up to render at the top and then render image or you could just hit F12 on your keyboard. Either one will work. So I'm gonna hit render real quick. As you can see, it's rendering one box at a time. And each one of these is 256 by 256 pixels. And I'm gonna pause this, just I'll come back once it's ready. Okay, and that just finished. So here's our rendered scene. Um, and we could uh, move that around with the middle mouse button. Zoom in and out with the middle mouse button as well. And so now that is my, you know, if I wasn't going to do any other work inside of Blender, I could save this out right now and I could just have a, a saved image. So if we wanna do that, what we'll do is go to image down here save as image or you can hit f3 it's going to bring me out here so um, i'm going to go into rendering and create a new folder renders and i'll call that rendering rendering basics 01 and now um, that's saved i could actually go open that up so if I go to Dropbox, rendering in my renders. So there it is. If I could open that up now, I have a saved image that I could work with. And uh, that's about it for rendering. I'm gonna actually go over a few more things real quick. If I wanna close this, I can just hit escape and I'll get rid of it now. Um, obviously you're gonna do this before you get into rendering, but there's also some settings you can set up on the camera um, to make your image look a little better or more realistic. At default, the camera's gonna have a 35 um, millimeter focal length, which is basically just the size of the lens, how zoomed in or how wide angle the lens is. 35 is pretty just normal vision. Um, if we go up, the, the higher the number, the closer in it's gonna uh, zoom basically. And then the lower the number, the more wide angle the lens will be until it looks insane. Um, you know, so work, play around with that, get an image that you like. Uh, for this one, I'm just gonna stick with 35. Now, another thing you can do is you have all these display options down here. You could have like title safe if you're working with movie titles or anything like that. You could have um, limits, which is gonna actually have to do with if you want some uh, depth of field in your image, if you see I turn the limits on and it gives me that line in this yellow plus sign. Now, if I want to, I could actually adjust the, the length of that. Basically that yellow plus sign is where the camera is going to be focusing. So if I go in the top view, I could adjust that so that's about even with my, my main mug and I could actually just move that right around there. You could also actually choose objects to just automatically focus on. Let me see, what's this called? So it's circle, I'm gonna call it mug, nug. And go back to the camera. Now I could just select mug and it'll focus on it. Although that's kind of, I think it goes to the 3D point of the object and I, depending on how shallow my depth of field is, that might be actually too far past it. So I'm gonna 
I'm gonna turn that off. And I'm just gonna adjust it manually. And that should be about good. So now if we look at it again, it's not gonna change anything because I actually haven't adjusted the aperture over here, which is what's gonna actually adjust the depth of field. So I usually change this to f-stop because that's more realistic to what an actual camera uses. You could, you know, you could use either, but uh, if you go with this, it might go down to one, and even that isn't really adjusting. Basically, the lower the number you have, the more depth of field or the shallower the depth of field will be. So if I go to like 0.5, I can see it's starting to get soft back here whereas the mug is still in focus. If I go to point 0.2, now you can see it's really getting soft back there. And if I keep on going low enough, this plate's going to get out of, the, out of focus and everything's going to be out of focus. So let's go to like point 0.1 even. At a certain point, you're gonna it's going to start getting ridiculous where it's going to look stupid or fake. So I know it's fun to play around with depth of field, but don't get don't get too excited about it to the point where you're making your image look worse if you're if you did so much work back here and then you're just putting it all out of focus uh that's a waste but then again you could also use that as a tool where if you know you're going to have like a close-up of a shot of an uh an object and you don't want to spend too much time in the background because it's going to be out of focus anyway you could use that to your advantage for this one, I think I had it around 0.5 or something, just like a little soft depth of field. So um, that's that's about it. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave us off there, and in the next tutorial, we'll go over compositing basics. So see you then. Thanks.